I introduce Paul Morin as our next speaker. Uh, Paul uh, is doing something that I didn't expect ever to occur on Blue Waters, but it's a fantastic project that he's going to share with you. Uh, and uh, we started this about a year ago. Uh, he is a uh, professor at the University of Minnesota, and he is the director of the Polar Geospatial uh, <coughs> Center there, uh, and has been working on a variety of things, but uh, a lot in the polar region. He's been to South, uh, 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 the South, uh, or uh, the Arctic as well as the Antarctic and is going to share what his current project is and maybe a little bit about the vision is. But I think this is a great example of this beginning of the convergence uh, imaging uh, work, convergence of modeling uh, and uh, other types of big data problems on, uh, on, the, on the same systems and how we can support that. So he and his team have pushed us to do different things, different ways, uh, and is making Blue Waters better and uh, hopefully he's uh, reaping a lot of benefit out of that. So, Paul? Thanks, Bill. So, I'm the guy when you get on the airplane, I'm in the window seat and I'm looking out. I'm the guy who, I'm in a tent in Antarctica. I've got six seasons in Antarctica, a couple times in Greenland. I'm also the guy that was um, hired as a second undergraduate at the Minnesota Supercomputer Institute in the 80s. And I did my, I paid my way through school in linguistics doing geophysics visualizations. Um, Steve Jobs called me a Unix weenie, which increased my, my, my consulting rate, I can tell you that. Um, we've got an office in the St. Paul campus of the university, right next to the fairgrounds in Paul Woodward's house. We're in the livestock pavilion, in the, in the basement of the livestock pavilion. And we've also got an office in McMurdo. So what's normal for my people is deploy to Antarctica for four to eight weeks a year, come back, work on blue water, have helicopter time flying around the dry valleys, okay? So about eight years ago, we had an opportunity, nine years ago, an opportunity to write a proposal to take over geospatial support for the Antarctic, okay? What that means is we became basically the, the US government responsible activity that provided maps for Antarctica, okay? You don't get that chance too many times in your career. And because we worked for Antarctica, for, for NSF, we, we gained access to resources that no, uh, normal PIs just don't get access to. And so we make maps. We don't necessarily send them to paper. Nobody sends them to paper anymore. We all just pull out phones. Even when we're walking around Antarctica, we often have Wi-Fi in some of the places we work in. And so we're pulling out Google just like anybody else. But we do do PDF maps. I mean, these are real maps. On, on, the, uh, on the left is a map of the dry valleys. This is one of the beautiful places on Earth. So this is, you know, think of the Grand Canyon, but a little colder. <laughs> um, glaciers plunging down the, the, the valley walls, all kinds of science going on with extremophiles and glaciology and geology. You have to remember that in places like the Arctic and the Antarctic, you, you live there. So the right is the hiking map for McMurdo. So just in case you're there anytime soon, we can hook you up with the map so you can do some hiking down there. Um, but about six years ago, we got access to a constellation of satellites. Oh wait, let me, before I get there, um, the program, traditionally, the Antarctic program, both programs, is a program about stuff. It's a program about rock hammers. It's a pro pro program with, with plane tickets. And we have some 
you know, our traditional ways of getting around and doing our science. I mean, number one is we get really cool ships. So this is, this is the, the Gould. It goes back and forth between Punta Arenas in South America and Palmer Station. The, the smaller boat is basically a, a landing craft. And you know, when you're down in Antarctica, you have to have two of everything because if one breaks, the other one goes, get, goes and gets the first one. Um, we have some really amazing aircraft too. We get Herc transports, not only with skis, but rockets out the back. You know, this, this, is, this is really amazing stuff. So, you know, these are planes that can take off at, at you know, over a mile already on the, on the polar plateau, and you hit those rockets because you've got skis, and you just have to break the surface tension enough to be able to lift off. You know, McMurdo, we love it, we hate it, it's there. Um, think about having a rundown community college in a mining town. You know, and we laugh. They're just about to rebuild the, the thing. They're going to build a new station called Ames. It's 1,000 people. It's two cash machines, three bars. It's got a yoga studio, its own air force. It's got a motor pool. It's one of the most amazing things because if you, you know, I heard comments of people being at this meeting where they were just amazed that, you know, of, of the, the variety of, of scientists that are here. That's the same way there. When you go to dinner, you have the person that, that did the penguins, you have the person that did the oceanography, you have the person that flew your plane last night. This is Disneyland. <laughs> this is Disneyland for people like us. And this is really how we used to do what I'm about to show you. This is a Scott tent, named after Scott, okay? We're out there, we used to be out there for weeks and weeks and even longer at a time, no shower, it's cold, you smell, your socks, always change your socks, but they just keep getting more and more aroma all the time. And when you start working in some of these places, the Arctic's a little bit different, but the Antarctic, it's one of the most protected place, places on Earth. And you know, it's a carry-in, carry-out kind of place. And in fact, most of the time, we're flying in and flying out. And it's carry-in, carry-out to the point where that bottle he's holding does not say pee for any other reason than you think. <laughs> OK? This is an extremely sensitive ecosystem. Anytime we can do work without being there, it's a really good thing. We gained access. So NASA handles satellites to about 15 meter resolution. There's another class of satellites from 10 or 15 meter resolution pixel size to about one foot, and that's these. Um, um, they're, they're commercial satellites. They're licensed to the US government from a company called Digital Globe out in Colorado. There's another class of higher resolution satellites. I don't have a clearance. I don't want to have a clearance. You can find it in Wikipedia. Those satellites are the ones that have some amazing capabilities, but so do these. So two of these have been deorbited. One is semi-broken. Three are just astounding. For these three satellites, we have imagery at resolutions of 32 to 42 centimeters, OK? It's amazing. It's a lot of data. The capability is astounding. It looks like this. This is McMurdo. Our office is on the left. The NSF logo, of course, is on the lower, lower right. We can, we can count the lumber in the, in, the, um, in the lumber yard in McMurdo from our desk, OK? This is astounding imagery. I can't give a polar talk without some kind of charismatic megafauna. <laughs> and charismatic megafauna that you guys hugged as a kid as a stuffed animal. 
everybody knows and really is astounding. You know, not only do these birds um, survive in a place that we really can't, but they really smell. <laughs> And not only do they smell, but they have the most absurd life cycle that you can imagine. When we're getting off the continent, I only go down there in the northern hemispheric winter, which is summer down there. That's when they're leaving the continent to go fishing. They go down there when winter's starting to set in. The females lay the eggs, they give them to the male, the males put them on their feet, they stand there, it's really cold. You'd never believe they would actually survive. And so the good thing about Antarctica is there are no trees. There's nothing in the way. And these things are big enough. They're about the size of a post that you back into with your minivan. You know, one of those. One foot resolution. It's extremely expensive and somewhat hazardous to go and visit these birds. They're all over the place. They aren't necessarily near stations. They're, they aren't near places where you can go and count them. So let's start using some high resolution imagery to go count them. And that's one of the first things we did here. We're still in the phase, the story I'm telling right now is we're dealing with mono imagery on a scene, scene by scene basis on a, on a PC on your desktop sitting in St. Paul doing email all day. And so one of the British, Peter Fretwell, from the British Antarctic Survey, used Landsat and looked at the entire periphery of Antarctica and said, I'm finding places that aren't white. I'm finding places that aren't gray. And he showed it around and found a bird biologist that said, yeah, that's poo. And he found the way to find all these penguin colonies. And once we gained access to this imagery, one of the first things we did was we targeted those colonies. And we found a whole bunch of new places. We went from something like knowing where 30 colonies were to upwards of 50. This is kind of what they look like. These birds kind of huddle, you know, when it gets really cold. The, the smear around them is really guano. We can see them from space. And so if you, if you look in the upper left-hand side here, um, you can see kind of a dark area by, by the ice. That is a colony of birds. That's a, that's a huddle of birds. And then they're walking, March of the Penguins, right? They're walking to the ocean to go feed. They were able to count them. This is what it looks like when you see these colonies. And we're getting this imagery. Remember, this imagery was licensed to the US government by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency for DOD and intelligence community activities. We're getting this imagery. We can see the birds. We can see the birds within hours of collection. We're using a satellite to count a vertebrate species. They get out. They stand there, they look up, you take the picture, you estimate the population, okay? It's 595,000 emperor penguins, plus or minus about 14%, okay? It's a vertebrate species. Antarctica and the, and, and the Arctic are a special place. These satellites are polar orbiting. We collect and we collect and we collect and we collect, and we collect, and the data flows, and the data flows, and we're getting 10, 20, 30, 40 terabytes a week, okay? That's a lot. Here's a figure from Digital Globe, the company that, that um, owns the satellites and operates in them for, for the government. And there's another thing you can do this, with the satellite. Just like your eyes have some parallax, you have distance between them, you can do the same thing with the satellites. Unlike NASA satellites, which go over and just are basically big flatbed scanners, these are telescopes. The telescope's looking down. 
and you can point them because the people who use them need a, need a picture of a place over there. And unlike a NASA satellite where you've got 200, 150, 250 kilometer wide image, we get about 13, 15, 17 kilometer image wide. And so you have to point these things. And so they have you know, little reaction wheels that you push against and the satellites go back and forth. So what that allows you to do is point, take a picture, wait 45 seconds, take another one. And you can extract terrain from that. And we started to do that. And in, in my organization, we're, we're science and, and logistics support. You know, remember, a huge amount of resources get into just getting people and keeping them in these places. It's like going to space. And so the Arctic part of um, the polar office at, at the National Science Foundation has a station in Greenland, the station summit station. There are two ways to get supplies there. You either put them in that Herc transport I showed you, and you fly them there at great cost, or you put them on a sled and you drive them. Driving them's a lot cheaper. And also, you can get bigger things there. And so, about once a year, they load up a few International Harvester tractors, and they drive from Thule Air Force Base in the northwest part of Greenland, all the way to the center of the ice sheet, dragging fuel, dragging stuff, and then they drag, drag garbage and stuff like that back. And most of the time, when you're on the ice sheet, it's pretty uneventful but not in the beginning. The beginning, you know, if you think about what the, the Greenlandic and the Antarctic ice sheet are, especially Greenland, it's a pie plate, and you've taken notches around the side, and you pour pancake batter in it, and it squeezes out those notches. That's the Greenland ice sheet, and you've got to drive over it, and you have crevasses, and you have weird topography all over the place, and what do you know? We have a way of shooting in stereo, extracting topography, and we can start to help them plan how to get there. And so there's the, the blue line is the route of the, the tractors up from Thule onto the ice sheet and to Summit Station. And once we make the elevation model, we can tell them within, say, a decimeter accuracy of how high that, how high that, that uh, ice sheet is what the slope is, and we can even start seeing things like crevasses. Crevasses, trust me, are bad. And so we started to collect more and more and more of this data. We use commercial packages on desktops. We use, we, one of my colleagues wrote another package so you could do this completely unattended. And we started to consider what would it take to just do the whole damn thing. Okay, this is 20 million square kilometers. The lower 48 is 10. There's not a lot of competition for the satellites in these areas, so we're collecting and collecting and collecting. And the stars started to align. We had software by a, uh, a postdoc named MJ No at Bird Polar at Ohio State that we could just basically give that software a pair of images and an elevation model would come out with an accuracy of about four meters, okay, unattended. Unattended is the big thing. We started to build the infrastructure to hold the data, so we've got a couple of petabytes of data locally. We, it was, it's a problem to just manage this and move it. And just to give you a sense of what we're dealing with, here's the year-by-year -year collection statistics since about 2005. So in 2005, we had Iconos and QuickBird satellites. So these were the, the 60 centimeter, one meter satellites. And so that data is flowing in. 2008, we get Worldview 1. Then we get Worldview 2, so these are like 42 centimeter satellites. And then we start getting 32 centimeter satellites. And each one of these satellites can collect about a half a billion square kilometers of one foot resolution imagery a year, okay? And the guy 
looking out the window in the airplane who also came from supercomputing. You know what I'm thinking. Get other people to write the software. That's the first thing I'm thinking. <laughs> and so they come up with a fairly, there, there are traditional ways of doing this photogrammetry, but they come up with a way where you can do it more efficiently without a seed DEM, without knowing kind of what the surface looks like, completely unattended, just feed it and feed it and feed it. And really what it comes down to is it's automated, high quality results no matter what the terrain, whether it's steep or shallow. It doesn't use any uh, a priori information. It all comes from the metadata of the images and we can run it on any HPC. So in other words, it is C and C++. This didn't exist in 2013. So basically what they do is they take patches of two images. They try to predict where one, one pixel is on the other. They move them around until they minimize error. And you do that for this project that I'm going to just start talking about right now. You do it approximately 20 trillion times. Okay. Then this happens. Oops. To make your plans a reality and to help Alaskans better plan for sustainable development, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the National Science Foundation are leading a public-private collaboration to create the first ever publicly available high-resolution satellite-based elevation map of Alaska by next year and the entire Arctic by the year after that so that we know exactly what's taking place all across this great state. So many of you manage students. I now have the way to motivate them. So I, I highly advise that when you announce your next project, please have the White House do it for you. <laughs> We're, the U.S. has now the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. This, so this is a council that discusses Arctic issues with the Arctic nations. Um, you know, it's, the, it's all the nations, you know, you're, you, would, you would imagine are, are involved with this. One of the issues here was the USGS committed to help put together a hybrid elevation model for the whole Arctic from everybody's existing data. And I spoke with program officers at NSF, and we said, we can do this. We can do it with existing resources. It just so happens at that time that I met John Towns at a, a workshop that Shantanu put together, and I had big pictures like I put back in the corner here, and I said, we could do this. And he started to, we started to, to think about what, what we could do. And John started to talk to, to Bill, and we started to get this rolling. It's interesting to see a project come together that if you were to sit down and write this as a screenplay, people would just go, no, it's not going to happen that way. And so the goal here is to produce a two meter posting elevation model of the entire Arctic, so 20 million square kilometers a collaboration between scientists, a science support organization, a classified um, combat support agency, and the National Science Foundation, okay? Believe it, don't believe it, we're gonna show you the data. And we're gonna deliver Alaska in 12 months. Here's the satellites again, we're using three of them. All the imagery is licensed to the U.S. government, which means we can't give away the imagery to people who aren't U.S. funded. But highly derived products, such as elevation models, can be freely distributed. Those are the three we're using, Worldview 1, 2, and 3. They're launching another one, Worldview 4, this fall. We never had this before. This is Greenland. This is the 800-pound gorilla on the back of sea level rise for the planet right now. As many of you know, it's melting right now, 
really fast. I was out there a few years ago, flew out by helicopter, you're, you're kind of dancing in between the crevasses. I sat down, I was putting an instrument down, I got up, my butt was wet. It's melting. In fact, you get to the edge and you see this rush of water coming off the ice sheet. And, and that's somewhat normal, but when it starts washing away bridges, that's not normal. The way we define the Arctic, it includes Kamchatka. This is one of the most incredible places, volcanoes everywhere. NSF has funded PIs going there. We're now producing elevation models of the plate boundaries there, the volcanoes there, the mountains there. This is about as high latitude as you can get in the Arctic. This is Novaya Zemlya, okay? An amazing ice cap, a small one on the end of the uh, of this long island. This is where the Russians or where the Soviets were testing hydrogen bombs back in the in the 60s and 70s. One of the amazing things that we found here is if you look at the topography of the geology around that ice sheet that's kind of in the middle, the, because ice is isostatic, you can see the topography as it runs underneath the ice sheet. <laughs> okay. My staff now accuse me of, of um, high job satisfaction now. Okay. We're plugging away on blue waters and just plugging and plugging and plugging. And we pull this data back. And I'm, I'm damn sure that I'm the first one to ever see any of this stuff. I'm seeing 30 degrees of the earth, myself sitting in the basement of the livestock pavilion over by where you buy corn dogs at the, Saint Paul, at, the, at the Minnesota State Fair. And we're seeing this place for the first time. Alaska. This is a state. This is our state. It's Arctic. It's coming out. The, uh, a version of this picture is back in the corner on the right. Go look at it. It's, it's, it's just amazing. This is, we're centered right now on a place called Tulik. There's a long-term ecological research station there. It's easier to do the vegetation, the geochemistry, the biochemistry, all now because we know how the water goes downhill. This is basic data. There really isn't anything more fundamental in the earth sciences than topography. This is more fundamental than the imagery itself. This is the shape of the surface of the earth. Geologists talk about the present is, is the key to the past. Well, the key to the present is the topography. There are societal issues here, too. So this is Point Hope, Alaska. So if you go to the north and to the west, and if you stop before you get to Russia, this is where you, where you go. And if you look at that sandbar jutting out, you see there's a grid of little dots there. That's the town of Point Hope. On that sandbar, there are a number of these in Alaska. They're talking about moving whole towns. This is some of the, the, the data that could be used to find them a new home. Canada's pretty excited. We're going to, for like Ellesmere Island here, have better to topo topographic data than they have for Ontario. For, for, for most of Ontario, I should say. And they're, they're collaborating very closely on all of this. Here's a place in, in Alaska, or sorry, in Canada, called Stephenson Island in Nunavut. What you're looking at here is something called the Drumlin Field. So this is a geomorphic structure that's formed by, by water rushing underneath a glacier. And you get these teardrops. You not only see the water direction, but you're seeing the direction of ice movement. This is the most fundamental data in earth sciences. Ellesmere Island, middle of nowhere. We can shoot it all the time. We can shoot it all the time because the satellites are going over and there's nothing else to point them at, so we might as well point them out at Ellesmere Island. This is from a couple of months ago. Eight meter is our scratch files. So we bring it to eight meter 
use that to figure out where the good, good imagery is, where the ones that produce the good elevation and the ones that don't. We throw the ones that we don't want out. We do an analysis of where the holes are. We send those holes to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. They point the satellites at those holes. That imagery comes back in. It goes back to blue waters. We process it again, see if we really shot the holes. This is quite an astounding thing to be doing 30 degrees of the globe with supercomputers and one foot resolution satellites. I've never seen anything like it. And so in places like here, you know, if you live in the Midwest, much of North America was covered by the Laurentide Ice Sheet 21,000 years ago. This is the last bit of it. This is something called the Barnes Ice Cap on, on Baffin Island in, 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 in Canada. And the ice sheet over the past 21,000 years has retreated to the point where it's about 50 kilometers wide. And we're watching it on a seasonal basis as it, as it just melts and melts and melts. So there are limitations here. If you were to go and get data from the USGS, the data that they require is called a digital um, terrain model. In other words, they want to see what the ground is and not the trees and the buildings. We can't see through that. And so we're doing a digital surface, surface model. It's, it's useful, but not quite as useful as, as what they're producing. This is optical imagery. These are optical telescopes in orbit, okay? Clouds are not our friends. And our solution to seeing through clouds is just to keep shooting until the clouds move. Not, not in the one orbit, but when you come back, you shoot again, you come back, and you shoot again, you come back, and shoot again. And then, you know, even in, in a place like the Aleutians, they have a nice day once a year or so. So the other thing is that this is a mix of seasons and years. We can only shoot the Arctic about once every two or three years which means that ice is moving, that, that the trees are burning or being cut down, all kinds of things are happening. The strengths, we have incredible capacity. We keep shooting until the sun is just barely over the horizon. DEMs can be repeated, okay? We can see not only change, but topographic change. And as the software and the ground control, what we usually what we tie the, the, the DEMs to, the imagery can be reprocessed. And so this keeps getting better and better and better. You can also measure vegetation. But one of the key differences to traditional ways of doing this is you don't need an airplane. And so the cost of this is extraordinarily small. And so let me show you then and now. So we've been, we, Iceland's back there, you know, a, a low resolution image on the wall. The Icelanders have been looking at this and they've been sending us examples. So this is the, the picture back there. Here's what they had before. It was one data point every 30 meters. That was then. This is now. Here's Reykjavik. That was then. There are the buildings, okay? It's public, it's free. And you can do all kinds of things. So we have Melissa Larson, she's a Greenlander. We actually found a Greenlander who knew geospatial analysis. We quick, quick, quickly grabbed her, she came over, worked for six months. And one thing that you guys may not know about the Arctic is when you have a village or a town, you're, you're often building your house on permafrost. You know, it's frozen ground. And so if you try to sink a well, the best you're gonna be able to do is suck out ice cubes. And so what they do is they drink surface water. But surface water has its own problems. It's easily contaminated, for example. And so you have something like 72 uh, settlements and villages in Greenland. And what they, what they try to do is draw a, a, an extent around the watershed and just say, don't put anything in there. And they can't do it. You can't do it all that accurately if you have a, you know, a surveying station. The DEMs weren't good enough. So she spent about a month on the test elevation models. And for about 50 of the villages, she delineated 
all the watersheds around the drinking water lakes in Greenland. They can keep their garbage out, they can keep their petroleum out, and especially in Greenland, you can keep your dogs out protecting water. I mean, this is just basic. I mean, this is basic needs of the Arctic population. And so this is where we stand right now. Much of Alaska is done to two meter. The rest of the Arctic is, is, is been done to uh, about eight meter. We're working on the second half of the imagery in, in, um, in Russia right now. Anytime there's a hole, we're trying to shoot that right now. This is what we collected yesterday, just to give you a sense of what the capacity is. So this is a map of the Arctic, and the way to read this is white is cloudy, um, green is mono, and the salmon color is stereo. We're collecting about one California a day in the Arctic. You need something like blue waters to pile through this. We've talked about just the elevation, but one of the most important things here is we can see the change. We can see the ice melt, and in this case, we found a place just in, in the middle of nowhere in Siberia. We had two pairs. One was from November 2012, another from June 2015. Created the elevation models. They're slightly off, so you put them together and align them slightly. And this is what you come up with. So over that three-year period, they cut an access road and cut down trees in these, these rectilinear areas, okay? And you go, okay, forest management, you know, that's kind of interesting. Think about it from, the, from, from a biologist uh, standpoint instead. This isn't forest management, this is where's the carbon? And when you have a 30 meter pixel from NASA, you have all kinds of problems with mixed signals where you may have dirt or rock or, or a parking lot. What we have here is the ability to see individual trees being cut down. Where is that carbon? Is it in the biosphere? Is it in somebody's house? Has it been burned? And in fact, we see it precisely enough that we know in this one clear cut, on the left side, the trees were 12 meters tall, and on the right side, the trees were 20 meters tall. <laughs> no airplanes. I don't even know where this is in Siberia. We just saw the difference and said, We've got to show people this. We can also see growth in certain places. You know, you start looking at um, um, the, the, the white and the ye yellow areas, and those are growth over three years of up to five meters. And this is the scary one. This is a tiny little ice cap. This is Vavilov. Um, if you go to Novozemlia, go to the right, go up, and you're never gonna do that because it's way in the middle of nowhere. It's about 30 or 40 kilometers wide on an island off the coast of, of Siberia. People get there every five or 10 years. We're getting there once a week these days. And so we, we've been shooting since, in stereo since 2013. And so that's, this is basically an elevation model colored by, by, by altitude going up to 700 meters. This was 2013. In the years between 84 and 2012, it was losing about four hundredths of a cubic kilometer a year. And this is kind of the scary numbers glaciologists think of. They think in terms of gigatons and, and cubic kilometers. So this is 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. We went from four hundredths of a cubic kilometer a year to four and a half cubic kilometers a year. So this one piece of ice is approximately one one hundredth of a millimeter sea level rise globally. And we're watching this fall apart. Currently, the surface of that ice sheet is dropping a foot a day. We're doing that with blue waters. I had asked if you want to. 
I don't necessarily want to see it again, but 13, 14, 15, 16. There are all kinds of other reasons why this is upsetting from a glaciological standpoint. This is supposed to be a cold-based glacier. It's supposed to be frozen directly to the geology. Cold-based glaciers don't collapse like this. Antarctica is a cold-based ice sheet. This seems to have turned from cold to warm, melting, water-based glacier, okay? That means other places can turn that way. There's the difference. We're talking about up to 90 meters of collapse in about three or four years. We have time. We have, we have stereo imagery going back about three or four years. It's not complete, we get what we can, it's not our satellite. We're working with very, very capable partners at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, but we're getting enough repeat that we're seeing things that we were never seeing before. And I just want to point out, this kind of thing has been tried before um, and, and successfully done. Back in February of 2000, there was a 10-day mission with the shuttle. It went from 60 degrees, 60 degrees north to 60 degrees south, which pretty much exactly excludes the poles. And in 10 days, they had, I believe it was an X-band radar that collected the entire Earth that was processed into a 30-meter resolution elevation model. We're talking about two. So we're doing 225 times more resolution than this shuttle launch. We're doing the poles and ours repeated where this is one. This was completely transformative for Earth science. I mean, it was extremely valuable for plate tectonics, and geomorphology, and you know, all kinds of science. Here's another interesting one. The, you know, our partners at the USGS are trying to do the same thing and succeeding to do the same thing, but with aircraft at higher resolution. They're getting a digital terrain model. So they put basically a LIDAR, a laser rangefinder, in an airplane, and then they zigzag, they mow the lawn over entire states. Sometimes the states pay for it, sometimes the federal government. Anytime you see that kind of yellow color, the imagery, the, the DEMs that we're producing, are higher resolution in the Arctic than, than the base elevation for those states. So we're producing higher resolution elevation than really exists on a statewide level in Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado. You know, we can't really believe that we're pulling this off. This, you know, if it really is, if we would have gone to central casting, we couldn't have come up with a, a better group of people to do it. I mean, this really was, you know, we wrote a, a two-pager, started circulating it around. This took vision. This took vision at, you know, ACI, at size, at polar, um, especially uh, NSF, uh, Arctic, you know, the Arctic program. It took vision at NGA, and it took vision from, from everybody at Blue Waters, you know, Bill and Greg and everybody else who, who made this happen. I mean, this for us is, you know, it's, it's one of the key data sets in our sciences. And the stars aligned. And the tools that you guys develop, the techniques you come up with for using this, this hardware, um, we're grateful. I mean, you know, Bill and Greg asked me to come and give a talk. I gave a talk because I wanted to come here and say thank you. There's no other way we can do this. This is Christmas every morning for us. And we're going to do our best to use this in the right way possible and to get this out as fast as possible because this is one of the key data sets to understanding the changing Arctic. And it's being done by the people in this room. And you know, we just we we just really, really, really appreciate it. And just to kind of sum up, my collaborator at Ohio State, Ian Howard, just got funded to do the other end too. So we're gonna have topography of ninety-eight percent of the ice on Earth in two years. Two two issues. 
I mean, this is just, you know, it's extraordinary. And remember, you know, we're doing this kind of thing with about three and a half FTEs. And it's 50% larger than Antarctica. And so, you know, this is what we look at every day. I come in in the morning and see these river systems. It's coming out of, of this infrastructure, this, this tool that you guys have put together. And the fact that, you know, I was driving, I was with my wife at a, a, at a meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We were driving back. I pull up my phone, of course, being compulsive like I am. I bring up the Blue Waters page and bring up the little pie chart, see how much I'm getting, and there's 54%. It's like, whoa. 54% for four hours is the country of India or Argentina at eight meters. Okay? That's the equivalent. We're still trying to get our mind around what, what, what's happening. And so with that, I just wanted to, to thank all of you. And I'll tell all of you what, I, what I've told Bill and Greg. Whatever you need, just let us know. We can't live without this thing now. And this is going to come out, and it just changes the way that everybody does science up there. So thank you. So thank you very much, Paul. That's a little bit different than some of the other uh, activities we've had. And I do want to say that the vision actually came from Paul, because he was the one who first said, I can, if I get enough resources, I can do this, and um, uh, that's where the credit goes. But uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun, and it uh, does help us understand what it takes to converge our data analysis and uh, data focus things with our modeling. But are they quite, oh, we're gonna go for about another 10 minutes here, and we're gonna start our parallel sessions 15 minutes late, and then I'll take us a little bit into lunch, but that gives us the full time so we don't have time pressure. Um, are there any questions, comments? So, uh, because things change with time, the geomorphology changes with time, so will you guys be repeating this again and again, say after you finish this in two years, then do it again? So, we all understand NSF, right? <laughs> this project ends in, about, in, in a little over two years. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. It would, put it this way, I'm just trying to get this thing out right now. It would be a, a positive development to have it continue. And just, <laughs> just a uh, quick question. Why just stop to the Arctic and Antarctic? Why not the whole world? If you can get that detailed stuff from geospatial satellites. You don't have to spend money on doing LIDAR and all if you can get two meter DEMs. Well, th there's two reasons. One is I'm paid to do the poles. I'm not paid to do what we call the middle. <laughs> um, the other thing is there are, re there are very, very good reasons to do LIDAR and to do aircraft over these areas. You can, s you can, you can see through trees, you can get higher resolution, there, there is, in many times, you know, more precision. Um, this is completely disruptive. We, we're not quite sure what this means yet. We know this is good, and we're not quite sure how good, and we're just trying to get our arms around that. And so it's a natural thing to do that. And I can tell you that, that um, you know, our partners at NASA and USGS and um, uh, NGA are all looking at what it would take to do the rest. It's a lot of cycles. Blue water too? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and there's an office in NASA for the Arctic and an office for the Antarctic. There's yep. not one for the middle 60 pr yep. uh, latitudes. So, uh, anybody else with a question or, or comment? So uh, can you talk a little bit about, you have customers who are going to use these images. Yeah. Can, uh, you gave one example about the, the watershed and, yeah. and water resources. Can you talk a little bit about the other types of customers you have who are looking forward to uh, using your data products to do right. science? And so we're funded to, to, to support science at both poles. 
And so we, at both poles, we have scientists that are glaciologists, geologists, biologists. We have social scientists that are worried about sea level rise. And they all have, you know, if, if they go anywhere, they, they need this kind of data. And also, if they're dealing with the surface of the Earth at all, this is the first data set that they want. And so with a geologist, they want to go in and look at the geology of an area before they get there. I mean, uh, one case from the other end in the Antarctic is we had um, uh, three groups of paleontologists go to a place called James Ross Island off the peninsula in, a, in an icebreaker. They were dropped off for a couple of weeks. And through the imagery and the topography we had, they were able to, to, to map the geologic fossiliferous contact, the, the place where all the, the, the fossils are, and map it around the entire island. They had the topography, and through the topography, they could see what the slope of that exposure was, and they could even figure out things as basic as, can I climb up that hill and get to it, or do I need a helicopter? So they were able to do the geologic maps, and they were able to do the logistics from this basic data. We've got people who are looking at, um, you know, right now the Arctic is warming up, it's drying out, and it's starting on fire. So we have before stereo for much of uh, for, well, for much of these these areas, and they use the, the the topography to figure out how high the vegetation was. We'll go back and shoot it again. You'll see how much burned off, and they can start estimating the carbon lost. That carbon, I can tell you, once it burns, it goes into the atmosphere, it's CO2. Any other questions? I, I have one other. If I understand correctly, when you get your images together, you don't really know how long it's going to take for that process to occur because right. you're trying to balance things. So uh, you basically have an indeterminate time period uh, for what that analysis with some bounds, right? So, right? so that's what you have to manage in terms of your mixing of jobs and mixing of, of what the images are. So Right. So when we take a, a pair of images that are 17 by 17 kilometers and we send it to sets of the software on blue water, that goes to a node, and then it's anywhere from two to say six hours to process that into eight meter topography. And you know the thing that breaks my heart as a Midwesterner is I can't hit that discount. You know, <laughs> but, you know where I, I you yeah, know, that, that I, I love blue water. Precise execution time, well clock time discount. Exactly. Huh? <laughs> you know, this is this is computing with coupons, and I I love that as a Midwesterner. And you know we can we can make it interruptible. We can do you know we can do all kinds of other things to make to be kind to the system because we're going to have hundreds of thousands, if not more, of these jobs. And we're finding we're working with all you guys to 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 figure out ways of bundling these together and using the resources really efficiently. So kind of a completely different question, but I'm just curious. Um, are there security issues at all with some of this? Like, you know, places that you can't put the data out and things like that you have to deal with? The, the, the main concern here is that the license, or the, the imagery is licensed. It's not, you know, NASA has a, a mandate to give everything away. Congress a while back, I can't remember whether it was Congress or a presidential directive, you know, helped set up the commercial imagery industry. And there is a legal limit, which is 25 centimeters, that no US company can sell imagery at a higher resolution than that. And you can pull out your credit card right now and buy the imagery that's producing, that's being used to produce this. And so, in other words, no. There's nothing classified here. We have to give some consideration to what we're doing within the U.S. Um, but other than that, it's, it's commercial imagery. You know, you really could, if you had a high enough balance on your credit card, you could do this project yourself. It'd be a pretty high balance on your credit card when you're done. I, just to follow up, have you thought of possible sort of negative societal impacts. I, I'm just, take a random example. Um, 
could poachers buy your imagery to locate megafauna? Well, I mean that's just I mean, a it's, crazy. You know, it's well, it's you it, the the imagery is it belongs to Digital Globe, and they can they can sell it to whomever they want. Um, the it's hard to do things like that penguin study. The penguins are easy because they just keep going back to that same place. But when you have migrating animals, you know, we, we have found muskox and polar bear and things like that. But you, you know, you've got a field of view of only about 17 kilometers. And these things walk around a lot. And also, it's unlikely that a poacher is going to have either the economic resources or the bandwidth to be able to pull this imagery down in near real time. So yeah, they could. There are better ways to poach. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thinking about using this data, like for model comparison, mm -hmm. um, this gives you the topography, but are you like in the Arctic, are you able to get a sense of sea ice thickness from this or? Yeah, we can. And so will you be producing a data set uh, for those types of things that can be used as observations that we compare against models? This is largely considered a terrestrial resource. So when the imagery is shot, it's generally only shot of land. It, we do do we do collect imagery over the Arctic Ocean on kind of a, a three-day repeat, um, but the sea ice community is less organized than the the community of terrestrial Arctic scientists, and we haven't had a lot of demand for it yet. the The accuracy that we're seeing is in 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 a several decimeter range, and so sea ice has to change quite a bit to be able to see that freeboard change. Um, once you get close to shore, though, we can see pressure ridges. And you know, it's, that's one of the problems we have, is how do you mask out the water? Because you know, you'll, you'll have that sea ice continue in most places in the Arctic for you know, quite a few months a year. And we're trying to figure out how to get rid of it. Um, but yeah, you, you, you can use it for that. You can also use it to find, now that um, Arctic ice, Arctic sea ice is, is melting so early and so quickly, we can go in and see these, these melt ponds and the change in the albedo of that ice on you know, a two meter pixel. And that's what's really kind of interesting is you can go in and there's a band on a couple of these satellites where you can actually start if you calibrate it right, you can see the depth of the melt ponds on the sea ice. So there's all kinds of strange things you can do. So thank you very much, Paul. That was fantastic.